All right, now, welcome to the STOA. Um, today, we have the fourth of um, the final session of our philosopher series with Robert Gilman. Um, if you have not seen the previous session, you know, we strongly recommend that you take a look at the previous three presentations. They're very dense as well as extremely informative. And today we'll be focusing more on a um, discussion type format. Um, Robert and I will have a um, conversation to start off probably for about 30, 40 minutes or so, um, followed on uh, where we would strongly encourage people to ask their questions to Robert. This is a great chance to dialogue and get a little bit deeper from not just the content, but also the subjective experiences of um, how we all here pursue the emergence um, or embody um, the emergence of the planetary model. Um, without further ado, um, Robert, are you good to go? Mm -hmm. yep. Great. Um, yeah, I think, I think the way that I'd love to start this off is um, we had a very short correspondence um, two days ago about <clears throat> kind of what, how, to, how do we want to shape the direction of this conversation? Mm -hmm. And I'd love to read out just uh, the little bit that you had about how you were, what you were hoping to encourage. Um, and you said you, you wanted to encourage people to see these times as offering immense cultural opportunity and at the same time, how important it is to understand one's own motivations and cycle dynamics. I want to kind of focus on that for a bit here, where um, what what we're what's very interesting about that articulation is that you know there are often the uh, view in the world that it's a rather difficult time, rather dire even, mm -hmm. and for you to frame it into a way where there are deep cultural opportunity for change and participation, it's a very um, at least for me it feels like a very empowering way of orienting to uh, a very com complex world. I'm curious about how you are holding that yourself and how did it come to you that you are holding that? For instance, in my case, I am holding that view because of people, uh, because of you and people like you mm -hmm. that informed me to give me the opportunity to kind of perceive a world that is deeply complex, but also deep, deeply opportunist. Mm -hmm. um, but how did you come about? You know, what, what's the an analog on your all right, let me see what I can. It probably goes back at least into my childhood, where I grew up in a really service oriented family. And I had, you know, not perfect, but a relatively good childhood. And that probably oriented me to, to see possibilities. Um, and so that was certainly a, a part of the picture. And then when in the in the 1970s, I would say that as I started to tune into things like the limits to growth study and other other ways of understanding that business as usual was not going to just keep going, um, then it it started to create a, a dialogue in me of you know okay so. Um, I really get that we can't just keep going the way we have been. And yet um, there is this sense that, you know, there must be some way forward. And so I've been pursuing that in a lot of ways. When we did uh, In Context Journal, uh, the, our editorial formula, if you will, was about 10% problem statement and 90% looking at what were the interesting sprouts of new stuff coming up that perhaps um, provided some way of addressing that kind of problem statement. And the more that I got into really understanding cultural history uh, and uh, just a little bit of, as again, I know this is ancient history, but back into the 70s and 80s uh, when uh, the, you know, some of the the big futurist stuff was like Alvin Toffler's The Third Wave, you know, talking about what the next uh, economy was like and looking back maybe a hundred years. And I increasingly felt that, you know, that's just not far enough. And, and you look at descriptions of Sumerian schools, uh, for instance, and they seem an awful lot like uh, schools, industrial era schools 
uh, in, in the world today. And it just tuned me in more and more to the sense that uh, our issues go a lot deeper than just the last hundred years or the last few hundred years. And the more I got into that and really looking at um, kind of the dynamics of cultural evolution, the more I got the sense that we are going through a time that is in part breakdown, but breakdown also means that you're freeing things up so that there's a chance of breakthrough. Um, and with that, um, what's breaking down is always a lot more visible because it's big and it's large and it's familiar. Uh, but what's breaking through tends to be much less visible um, because it's new and it's still emerging and you know all these various things that go with it. Um, so that all filtered in for me and, and helped me kind of recalibrate my sense of what's going on in the world. It's not a matter of categorically saying, oh, no, no, the story in the media is all wrong. It's, it's more that the story in the media is only part of the picture. And um, kind of going all over the place with this, but, but a piece of this is also understanding that there's a very strong market pressure on the media to appeal to your amygdala. You know, the, the, the more that you can focus on whatever it is that, that grabs short-term attention and, and, you know, and fear is a, you know, is it, is it, it seems like a great thing for grabbing short-term attention. Um, and so that affects not only the media, it also affects activists who are also very much, I mean, we're in this world in which attention is the short, uh, you know, is, the, is what's in short supply. And so everybody's struggling to get attention. And so you go for the thing that seems to work best and you focus on fear. Um, but unfortunately, fear is kind of like uh, one of these drugs where you have to keep hitting it harder and harder to get, to get the same result. Um, and it is disempowering. And I was fortunately able to be involved in activities where it wasn't like that. And it didn't have the media appeal, but um, it, there was more of a focus on what could we do, what are the, you know, how can we solve problems, and um, and increasingly, how can we do this in ways that are really nourishing, um, and saw that, that that generated much more sustainable motivation, and also the feeling that. Um, if we are going to find our way forward, we're only going to find our way forward by believing we can find our way forward. Um, the uh, one of my um, someone that I really admire. Let me just put it this way: is is uh, Amory Lovins and what he's done through Rocky Mountain Institute. Huge amount of work over decades, which I think has put us in much better position. To, uh, to really deal with climate change issues than, uh, than a lot of other stuff. And one of his ideas is to focus on what he calls no regrets activities. You know, you don't necessarily know how things are gonna work out, but if you, can t if you can engage in an activity that, well, you know, whatever, it's, it, however it works out, you will feel good about what you did. Um, and one of the no regrets activities that I was involved with during the 1980s, particularly, was what was called citizen diplomacy with the former Soviet Union, where we were making people-to-people uh, uh, -people connections, where the connections had been tightly controlled on both sides um, by the powers that be. And we were one of the most potent ways to change a system is to introduce a new communication loop. And, and we, were, we were doing that. Um, and it didn't get, a, you know, didn't get a lot of media in the U.S. It actually did get more attention in, in the Soviet Union. But it also wound up feeding really important ideas into Gorbachev's circle uh, at that point. Uh, and it was fun. <laughs> and it was interesting. It was nourishing for the people who were involved. Were we going to prevent the nuclear war that seemed to be on the verge of happening? We didn't know, but we felt we would much rather have been doing that than sitting around wringing our hands, worrying about what might happen. 
And in fact, what we did may very well have contributed to, um, you know, the, the transition for, this, for the Soviet Union has been messy in various ways, but it's hard to remember how awful the scenarios were back in the 1980s in terms of nuclear winter, et cetera, et cetera. We still have the human capacity to do that. It's just not in our uh, awareness much, but it's all there in the militaries. Um, but we did pull ourselves back from that brink. Um, so it's, it, so this has been a long ramble. Let me, let me kind of pull it back and say that um, for me, if we are gonna have any chance of a bright future, we have to behave as if a bright future is possible and, uh, and move towards it. That does not guarantee that we're going to get there. But if we don't do that, <laughs> the chances are much less that we will get there. Cool. I, I actually greatly appreciate you kind of, um, I think you, you might've used the word rambling, but kind of going all over the place a little bit where if you and I, if we imagine you and I as sort of uh, uh, gardeners of this conversations. It's almost mm -hmm. like we're spreading a lot of seeds in a way that I'm almost like, wow, I have like five things that I want to immediately reply with. But instead, I'll just pick on one first, which is you said something that I think uh, is, is quite remarkable. And, and I'll roughly paraphrase, which is you said something like during the citizen diplomacy um, kind of project that you are participating in, um, you, you, you both had fun and got important ideas into Gorbachev's, uh, Gorbachev's circle. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it's, you know, one or the other might be interesting. Both together, I think, is something a little more extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And I think on that level, it's very similar to if we were to even think about how polarization is a lot more proliferate today um, from uh, in terms of mimetic tribes, whether it's something as obvious of, mm -hmm. of, of say the political red versus blue, but also in the sense of even the different tribes that's represented on this call alone. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear a bit more about your experience from that. Like what, what leads you to be able to be able to um, speak to your own experience in a way that both talk to very dramatic impact in terms of the international diplomacy end while enjoying your own experience of it. I think it's deeply related to your mention of the no regret policy earlier. And I'd love to hear you expand a bit more on that insofar as, you know, during the uh, bipolar superpower days, perhaps Soviet Union and the US were the primary uh, uh, proponents of thinking about that. But now everybody is in a position to think about their participation in, in making impact and having an experience that they enjoy of themselves. Yeah, well, this is, so as things have evolved, this is one of the things that delights me about embody the three harmonies. Because if you're really working on, how do I say this? If, if you really wanna get things done with other people, then somehow or another, you're going to have to find your ways to work together. And that isn't always easy, human beings being what we are. Um, and the more that you have a good sense of what's going on inside you, the better able you are to be able to change the system of the group by changing yourself and also know what fruitful things you can do perhaps to help the group itself change. Um, doing that, working on harmony within is its own reward. You know, the more you've got harmony within, the more delight you're able to have um, in just the process of your life. Um, and so it's, you know, certainly, Working on developing the harmony within is a no regrets activity. Uh, and it, and my sense is that if you treat that in a silo, if you say, I'm just gonna do harmony within, forget the world, forget all these other people, maybe is a temporary thing, maybe. 
but, um, but you're kidding yourself because we are social beings. We are embedded in a larger environment. Um, we won't, it's, it, we don't, we're not just skin encapsulated egos. We can't just separate ourselves off that way. So even though it seems like a separation to talk about harmony within, harmony with others and harmony with nature, you really have to work on all three at the same time. Um, so to really do harmony within uh, means doing it in a way in which you're, you're in touch and, and participating in that larger environment. But then if you are doing that, chances are good you're, you're a much more useful contributor into, into the whole. Um, so it, and you can do that on all kinds of different scales. You know, maybe, I mean, when we start, first started, uh, you know, but, but at a practical level, what citizen diplomacy meant was that we would organize a tour of, you know, maybe, 15 or so, um, mostly North Americans and some Europeans to go over to the Soviet Union. And we had some contacts in, in the Soviet Union who would help us to arrange things. And, and the, the, the Soviet government always wanted to make sure they had lots of control. Um, uh, so we would, we would get in and they would frequently have us, they would invite us into this you know, meeting room with this big table and we'd sit across the table from some, some bureaucrat who would want to lecture us on why we needed to give up our missiles and all that sort of thing. And, and, but we had brought with us a peace quilt. And so we would say, well, I, you know, I'm afraid we really can't, we don't have much to say about the missiles, but what we're really here to do is to share this peace quilt with you and hope you can find some place and, and people in the US had, had stitched together this quilt uh, that we brought with us. All of a sudden, the bureaucrat on the other side of the table melted into a grandparent. And we were getting invitations home for dinner and, and it was a, a totally different story. Um, and, and, and of course it delighted us whenever that happened. Um, so that's part of the fun. You never know where those things are gonna lead but they won't lead anywhere unless you show up, um, and, you know, unless you, you create the opportunity. Yeah, and, and I wanna, you know, using, using your earlier word again, although you're referring this, uh, you're, although you're referring to this as somewhat like ancient history, um, I find that how you described it there, for example, <clears throat> the bureaucrats melting into a uh, grandparent inviting you home for dinner, feel like it helps make uh, those ancient history real. And part of how you know, we framed at the beginning, the, the cultural moment is not so much a moment as it is a transitional phase lasting hardly on the level of decades, but actually over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And so to part of to make that, um, uh, somewhat ancient history, a little more real. I actually have a prop here of um, uh, an in context magazine uh, issue from 1985. And it's very fascinating to be able to um, actually read Robert's words on cultural change from 40 years ago and have Robert live 40 years later talking to me uh, in person. And part of what I think is really significant about that is because. Um, as, it, as it may be ancient from one perspective, uh, in another sense, it's deeply uh, present. And so I, I'd love to combine that and really bring out a bit of the um, subjectivity of your experience and history, Robert, like the uh, uh, citizen diplomacy example. Could you share a bit about, you know, what made you, uh, what led to your kind of ideation and subsequent pursuit of in context? Um, I mean, I don't imagine it's because you were after, uh, you know, humongous wealth or anything like that. And so um, hearing about what were the uh, motivational structures that led to your belief that this is a worthwhile project and having pursued it for so long. And I, I would love to get into a little bit of the transformation into the context.org and then the bright future now later. But starting with kind of how that happened would be, I think, really illuminating in terms of how we collectively participate in this large uh, transitory pe transi transition period of um, cultural change. Yeah. Okay. So um, a little bit of prehistory. 
uh, here is that in must have been late 78. Um, Diane, my then wife, and I, um, and our son Ian, uh, I won't give you all the story about how we got there, but we wound up in uh, mini in uh, Milwaukee, uh, where uh, David Spangler and Milenko Matanovic were doing some. Um, some courses through the uh, University of Wisconsin Extension Service because Belden Paulson, who was the kind of the honcho there, uh, knew about the work of, of uh, this is Finthorn related stuff um, and, uh, and knew about that work and wanted to share it in his community. And we showed up there and we also knew uh, about their work. And we arrived really at the end of a series of um, courses that both of them were doing. And so they were getting feedback from the participants and the participants were saying, you know, we really love this philosophical stuff, but we also want something that's really practical. And at that point, uh, our Diane and Ian and I had been living on about $5,000 a year and in a pattern that we thought of as living lightly. Um, and so we said, okay, so for the next quarter, we'll offer a, through the extension service, a course on living lightly. Uh, and we did that and it was well received. And, but at the end of it, I felt, you know, I don't wanna just be giving these courses um, because this is really something that needs to be embedded in community. And so went back to where we were living, had been living in Washington state and created something called the North Olympic Living Lightly Association. North Olympic, because it's, it's just across the water from um, Victoria and Vancouver Island on the, the northern part of, northwestern part of Washington state. Um, and living lightly was meant to have multiple meanings. And it was really, um, uh, let's see, it was really something that I'd gotten out of, out of Rain Magazine, but it was, it was both low environmental impact, but it was also a certain brightness of, of spirit um, uh, in all that. And so we put together this community organization. It was the North Olympic Living Lightly Association. Um, and we did that for, a f actually for a few years and we had gatherings and, and uh, of various kinds, and we had a little skills directory, which the IRS was kind of not so sure about whether we were engaging in barter or anything like that. Um, but we managed to get through that one. And we had this little six page uh, monthly newsletter that was put together on a selectric typewriter, which is one of my traumatic experiences of, of trying to do that. Uh, but we found that, that Increasingly, we got requests from further and further away. First, it was other parts of Washington State, and then it was down to California, um, and then it was um, other parts of the US, and then all over the world, we were getting requests for these monthly newsletters. And, and I was getting tired of working on this electric anyway. Um, and right around that time, I got a job working as a researcher, not in astrophysics, just a kind of a, a, a researcher with a, a, a local architect who somehow had a relationship with Mitsubishi Electric and they were researching new consumer products. Um, and he had scored some of the first Apple II computers. And so this was my introduction to something that worked a hell of a lot better than a Selectric typewriter. And so, out of that experience and out of all of this interest that was showing up from all over the place, we decided to step out of doing the local uh, environmental uh, or, or the local community group, let me put it that way, um, and start this quarterly instead of every month, couldn't stand it every month. Um, so this quarterly that would now go out all over the world. And it did wind up 
going out all over the world. Um, and it was from the beginning, and it was true with the, those little newsletters too, but with uh, in context, the, the intention was to focus on a theme and really uh, bring forward what its possibilities were. Um, to help to the, the subtitle on in context is a quarterly of humane sustainable culture uh, and we wanted both of those it needed to be humane it wasn't just sustainable and it needed to be sustainable and not just humane because uh, it wasn't going to be humane if it wasn't sustainable um, so definitely pulling those pieces together um, or and you know what motivated me to to do it in that particular way, it's it's a little hard for me to entirely go back, but it, I think it, you know even then I was really sensing this this energy of possibility and the degree to which I felt that um, if people had more exposure to that sense of possibility, then you know that might help, um, and so we did in context from essentially 83 until 95. Um, and and I don't, don't wanna go off on this now, but 95 was a traumatic year for me. It started into a traumatic few years, um, but, um, but that was uh, 83 to 95 was the in context um, period. And it's all been with the same 501c3, it was the, the same 501c3 that we created for the North Olympic Living Lightly Association. We just, at some point, changed the name. Cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm really just um, taking in the, the arc of that. And something that I, I quite enjoyed was watching the faces of people on the call, different people nodding and smiling, and kind of feeling as we went through the history of it, different parts of that history touching different people in a way that I felt really um, kind of invigorated by. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, I'm, so, so as I kind of bring the history, uh, as I kind of try to bring the history forward, you, tell, you can you know, feel free to navigate it in a way that you feel most comfortable with. And kind of the, um, I'm curious then, eventually as you transited things onto context.org, where you know currently all of the old issues are available, um, how did um, how did that transition feel to you? Especially as you describe the history of technology as well, going all the way back to you know the first of the Apple computers. Um, how how did that transition look to you? In part because uh, you know I am I think you know some people would call a digital native. By the time I was born, the internet was already around and functioning, and so the the um, I don't really know what it's like to make that transition and in addition um yeah yeah let's let's start with that part first unless of course i i don't know exactly when bright future network um kind of got started mm -hmm. but wanting to hear the transition now into the later stages of organization as right. you learn i'm sure a tremendous deal over the period of the 80s and 90s for this right so um yeah we were we were probably more computer savvy than than a lot of I mean, we were on the, the, the upside of the bell curve, if you will, uh, in, in all that, with what we were doing in the, in the 80s. Um, and I mean, that's one of the reasons why we have a URL like context.org, because we got in to get it when nobody else was thinking about those things. Um, we actually had thought about getting ic.org for incontext.org, but intentional communities had already gotten it. So. <laughs> Uh, just as well. Um, so the so I need to talk a little bit about what happened for me and for Context Institute in the mid 1990s because that was it was a significant transition time, including that transition with uh, the technologies. Um, so the in the early 1990s, there was, we started to have a, a significant more activity beyond just the magazine. That was the time when uh, we got asked to uh, create a report that basically served as the start for the Global Eco Village Network. 
And it was also the time that I was really involved at a national level with the um, American Institute of Architects and their uh, Committee on the Environment, uh, where the, the architectural profession was going through its transition of really grasping what green architecture meant. And so I was, I was one of the non-architects that was involved in, uh, in that uh, and, and getting something going, which is called the Global Action Plan, uh, which was a household program for a uh, six month household program for households to transition their environmental impact. Um, never took off in the US, but it became a national program in the Netherlands. Uh, and so we were doing, you know, all of all of this stuff. And so it's, it's kind of expanding out into um, these additional areas. And at the same time, when so we had kind of developed in context during the Reagan era. And uh, it turns out that it's a lot easier to sell alternative publications when your people aren't in office. <laughs> uh, when, jeez, uh, uh, when Clinton got elected, our subscriptions went down and we had a, a, a harder time getting subscriptions. And by the time the 95 had come, we were in, in deep financial trouble. Mm. And at that point, the internet was still really raw and, and new. There weren't really even decent browsers, um, but being who I am with my antenna out, uh, I saw it coming. And I said, okay, well, let's stop print, which is expensive and difficult and challenging, and let's move on to the web. And the others in the organization said, what? <laughs> what the, on the web? What's the web? What's, the, you know, that can't work, right? So uh, that set off uh, what became a pretty challenging, uh, organizational crisis. Um, I'll just say that, and I don't want to really go into the, into the details of that. Um, but uh, it basically there was a you know there was a split. Um, the and what I did was to take what we had and put it up on the web. As, as a way to, uh, to get started. We did that in, really in 96 or so. Um, but in, um, and, it, and it was in 96 that wound up coming to where I live now. Uh, there was just a lot of upheaval that was going on at that point. And then in mid 97, Diane um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. And uh, she lived for about six more months. And, uh, and I was her primary caregiver for those six months. Uh, so we were in a situation where my, um, we really didn't have an economic base anymore. Uh, my professional life was falling apart. My partner was dying. Um, and I had my 16 year old daughter that I was, um, you know, now single parent for. Um, so it was, let me just say it was a pretty traumatic time. Um, and once, uh, once Diane had, had died, um, and then I was, you know, okay, so what's happening now? And it was clear to me that I had a choice that either I just, died with her in effect, uh, or I would need to be a child and, and enter a new incarnation and allow myself to be a child. And fortunately I was, I was able to do that, but it, it was, you know, it took a while of, of process and there was definitely a lot of dark night of the soul uh, to go through. Uh, you know, God, we've been doing all this good stuff. What do you mean pulling the rug out? Um, 
it, it, it was anyway I won't go down there but um, it, but it definitely got me in touch with um, with the trauma side of life you know mm -hmm. part of part of my part of the benefit in my life was that my early life was mostly pretty positive I mean you know we all have our knocks but it was mostly pretty positive um, and it was during that time that I learned a lot about my own psychodynamics. And then in terms of, so when does this connect to bright future? Um, it, my gradual steps forward were in, let's see, I think it was in like, um, 2004 was both when I remarried, married my current wife, Liana, and, um, and also got involved. I was asked to join the local city council because there was a vacancy. And so they, and they needed to fill it. And I was asked to apply for that vacancy. And I was chosen and then spent from then until 2011 on the local city council. And I was doing what I could to, to see what I could bring in in terms of sustainable living and other things into this. I live in a town of a thousand people, it's tiny. Uh, but hey, what a better laboratory, I thought. Uh, well, some things worked and some things didn't. And of course I learned a lot in that process also. Uh, but by the time the town was done with me and I was done with the town, uh, the then, I started to get this pull to to head back um, to the to a larger environment, and I had been playing with the idea of the foundation stones uh, all the way back in two thousand. And I, I didn't tell you this part, but in two thousand, I was spent a number of months in in uh, New Zealand, actually, with uh, with a, a uh, Rabina McCarty, who was a, you know, been a, a very close friend. Um, and that's kind of when some of this stuff got going. It's also when the three harmonies were, uh, when the first time that I, I did my expression on the three harmonies back in 2000. Um, but there was a long gestation. And so I felt, well, let's see what we can do to start working on those uh, foundation stones. And that's when the, what time is it? got born. Um, and my first presentation of the what of what time is it was actually at at Fintorn at an intentional communities conference. Um, and that's not the, the version that you see in the videos. The, that the second version was was done in Seattle. And then so that was in 2014 that that one was done. In 2015 we did the the one on um, human operating system literacy and system literacy. And by the time I was done with those two, there were two things that were really clear to me. One was I was exhausted doing those and, and creating those and, and doing all the orchestration to make all, you know, and making and doing the video editing and the whole schmear. Um, I needed to find people that I could work with. And the other thing was we had enough material now to put something together. And so that was when the idea of Bright Future Now and the Bright Future Network got going. So I had a pause there, but that's that's probably enough. Yeah, I I am very struck by the story. And I feel like I I and thanks Stephen for sharing those story, uh, the foundational stone videos. Um, the What Time Is This series has been especially informative and impactful on me, and it was actually the introduction for me to your work. Mm -hmm. um, and I greatly, greatly appreciate hearing some of the details of your story that I have not had before, in part because um, I think behind each of the, um, behind the work of, you know, anybody in whatever field they may be in, lies the human stories, mm -hmm. the actual processes that yield the, the um, results that we see. You know, For every book that I can pull off my shelf, there's a real story behind there of the human process right. that actually yielded that. And so getting a glimpse into your history 
with what you're willing to share is mm -hmm. deeply valuable for getting more of the humanity that actually moves us forward. And in, you know, we our lives are not built from uh, you know book after book or creation after creation. It is instead the foreground is instead made of our lives, and and those mm -hmm. um, creations are some are distillations afterwards. And so seeing behind the scenes, it's really valuable, and I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, and, and as you had also commented, there's a pause there. There's the next segment on the bright future now in terms of how um, things took on new lights, as you had kind of mentioned, you know, with the first articulation of the three harmonies. Yeah, where now? Yeah. So I think part of, part of what motivated me around putting together Right Future Now was my experience with various kinds of networks. Um, that includes the, the Global Eco Village Network and, and certainly what I'd done before with the, the North Olympic Living Lightly Association, but lots of other networks that I've been part of and uh, exposed to and, and also seeing a lot of various activist activities, seeing what was going on in intentional communities, et cetera. Um, the, I, my interest in intentional communities got going early. We, we were involved in various intentional community networks in the, in the 1980s as we were just getting in context going um, because I saw intentional communities as this really interesting laboratory where people had more freedom to experiment with a lot of ways that they could put their lives together, uh, relationship lives, work lives, building, food supply, you know, all, all of these different pieces. And I really admired the degree to which people were willing to experiment with their own lives in that way. Over time, I got to see a couple of things. One was that it's a big hurdle. Uh, it's a lot to ask people to uproot so much of themselves and go into an intentional community. Um, so if if we really wanted something that was going to be accessible to more people, we needed to have a, a different model. Um, and the other thing was to see that mm, these people brought their stuff. And uh, while some communities had relatively good ways of working with that stuff, um, I didn't find any that I felt really cracked, cracked the nut, if you will. Um, and so this really drew me to how do we put something together that um, will help people to do more with uh, in terms of the harmony within uh, because that's so crucial to the to the whole process and how can we put together some kind of mutual support network that doesn't require as big a life shift as going into an intentional community. So then in principle, it could be accessible um, uh, to a lot more people. Out of all that, and out of my experience with other networks, I was not attracted to the idea of simply what today would be, let's create a Facebook group and we'll call it, we're the new da 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 da, -da. everybody come, you know, just join. Uh, no onboarding at all, no nothing. Um, and, and you may get hundreds of thousands of people to join up, but my sense is that you, you, the result inside is, is what you have outside, basically. People bring what they were, and, and there's, no, um, there's no real dynamic in that. So uh, I really wanted to do something where the network was built with, a, with a, a, a meaningful onboarding process that would help to create common culture and common ground uh, and provide useful um, shared tools. Uh, and being the, the, well, let's just do it kind of guy, I just said, well, we'll just put this thing together, you know? And I treat it all as partial selective and provisional. So, um, you know, stuff may, it continues to evolve. Um, but now with 300 people or so who've gone through Bright Future Now, 
uh, I think I can say we're, some, something's working. Mm. Yeah, I, I very much feel in that the degree of experience that you have had in being able to um, perceive the larger patterns that play out in communities and different community type projects mm -hmm. that gives you kind of the um, choice making capacity to think about how you want to design uh, the iteration that you want to uh, mm -hmm. lead in principle. And to that end, I want to I want to combine a question that has been asked um, along with a uh, along with kind of my own curiosity in this direction, which is something like um, I believe you have said in the past the importance of a practice of living together, um, the, the importance of actually being able to, uh, like you said, rather than just joining it, the, the uh, significant training implications of the three harmonies starting, well, you know, certainly mm -hmm. including uh, harmony within. When it comes to, let's say, you know, um, a person that um, has challenging experiences or traumatic experiences in their uh, respective lives, let's say in a bright future network. Mm -hmm. How does the network, which is I understand primarily online, um, how does it relate to the, let's say the social stack to which each of the uh, bright future now um, network members would have their own lives and projects probably connected to a larger BFN kind of mm -hmm. um, infrastructure. Would you describe a little bit about how that uh, functions or how do you understand that functioning uh, gets thought of? Yeah. Well, I would say that the, we're still figuring that out. We're still discovering a lot around that. And that the intention is not for the Bright Future Network to be your primary social existence mm -hmm. for most people, for most people in the network. There will be some people who are really involved in making it all work. And then they're, you know, they're part of the team, and it does become a, a more significant part of, of their experience. But that's not the expectation for, for most people. Um, it's at the same time, and this is part of what we're still trying to figure out how, how it works. Um, we don't want it so loose the way many networks are where it, you know, you're just kind of occasionally uh, uh, touched into it. So we're, we're moving towards being able to have a lot of subgroups within the network. I mean, the network is, I like to say the network is yin, it's there to support. Uh, it, it isn't like it's carrying a big flag out into the world and asking you all to sign up as foot soldiers. Um, it, it's it's a not a great analogy, but it's much more like a professional association in, in that sense. Um, and we want to be able to provide the, uh, we, we do this to some extent now, but we're working on getting much better at doing this, uh, to provide the infrastructure that enables groups to clump and cl cluster and, and uh, but, but communicate out with peers who share some common ground and some common experience. And, and this feels like a really juicy environment to have both of those going on. And in some cases, those clumps uh, will be, those subgroups will be uh, online, uh, just online. But in other cases, they could be face-to-face um, uh, -face based as well. Um, mm -hmm. But we're not really, we don't see our role as therapy we recognize that what happens in Bright Future Now and Bright Future Network can be therapeutic, but, but, it's, but we're not, it's not our scope of practice, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be our scope of practice to help people to find uh, appropriate therapy if that's what they wanna do, or to be in a group that is therapeutic and support that and learn from that and um, have all that exchange going on. Uh, but that's, uh, it's a because we have this larger cultural agenda. Um, we want to make sure that we don't get stuck at the therapy level, if you will, if if, if you if you understand what I mean. Um, to 
to support that balance of people having agency in the world and having their impact in various ways, and then having the support to keep removing constraints. Cool. Um, oh, uh, did I just lose my train of thought there? Give me a second. Uh, ah, got it, yes. <laughs> um, so uh, I think at this point, I just wanna more formally announce that we'll transition more and more towards uh, a Q&A type of experience. I would strongly encourage people to put their questions in if you have any, I'm sure, I'm sure some people are at least sitting with them. And the um, if you would like me to read it on your behalf so that it's not on recording, just indicate as such. Otherwise, I will call on you. Um, I'd like to pass on to one more, though, with, uh, with you, Robert, which mm -hmm. is um, when it comes to... So you had mentioned that the uh, Bright Future Network is meant to be a kind of the yin layer that holds um, others' um, manifestations. Um, then I'm curious in terms of for your own kind of personal organization, how do you um, craft the practice of living together um, insofar as you perhaps that might come from uh, or different ways of thinking of that might be um, how might you think about that from the angle of say your children or perhaps your grandchildren if you have any um, as well as the angle of how you yourself have a community of practice that enables this ongoing learning of the three harmonies um, in yeah, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Yeah, okay. So in my case, and I, I, I certainly would not describe this as anything other than what's happened. <laughs> uh, but in, in my case, I would say, first of all, that um, Liana and I have, have a, are very much in an ongoing process of working with the three harmonies and, and supporting each other in that, so that's a that's that's a face to face setting. Um, I don't have a lot of face to face contact, um, uh, in person contact with others. I have face to face contact on Zoom uh, with with a lot of people, but um, it's it, I just want to say you know different kind of thing. But I have a number of people that where we work together on this, and we have ongoing, you know, we, we connect once a week, but we've been doing it for months and in many cases years. Um, and we're just friends and as, as well as coworkers. Um, it, and it, so that winds up being an important part of all this, but I think we're, we have more to learn about how to um, go further with that and it's one of the things that we're working on, which we describe under the broad title of the deepening program of how do we take content that was in Bright Future Now, uh, deepen into it. How do we deepen into that savvy about psychodynamics, skillful with multiple modes, of, uh, with diverse modes of cognition and, and adept at, uh, at the new strategy for success. Uh, how do we really live into it? because culture has to be lived. And so we really see an important part of what we're doing as being this lab in which we practice. Um, and it's, um, and I will say that for me, you know, we've maybe manifest 10% of the vision by now. That there's a lot more to go. Um, that, which sometimes frustrates me enormously, but um, but it's what is, and we just have to move with it in, in the way that the that events allow. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm curious then to to kind of mm, ask you a bit in the direction of when it comes to, especially with uh, Br uh, Bright Future Network. Surely, mm -hmm. you have had glimpses into many different kinds of. Um, projects, not only in your past, but presently in the Bright Future Network, uh, different kinds of organizing, trying to uh, live out the planetary model. Now, I'm curious, when you um, per perceive uh, these projects and initiatives, um, what do you tend to pick up about them? How do you go about evaluating them? Um, when, you, when you see, say, another uh, project on the uh, either new or old or emergent, um, 
uh, project on the Bright Future Network. How do you think about what kind of patterns have you seen historically with these kind of attempts, as well as what do you notice about them, or what do you appreciate about them? What do you what are you wary about them? Yeah. So, um, so we're still young. I don't have a deep body of statistics to to share with you, but I can. But I think, and so having put in that caveat, let me just describe. So one of the, one of the projects that's uh, associated with the network um, is this wonderful um, group in in Senegal, really focused on northern Senegal, uh, that is where the spark plug there, the person who is the originator, Usman Pame, um, grew up in that area. Um, he's currently, among other things, a, a professor at one of the universities in Dakar. Um, and he became the first president of the Global Eco Village Network in Africa. And what he has been doing has been bringing things like permaculture and other uh, 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 ideas and practices that he's gotten out of his connections in the in the eco village network and helping the his local community to retain its depth and value because those people understand community a lot better than most westerners do um, in an environment that's really tough they're on the southern edge of the sahara desertification is is uh, a real challenge, uh, but he's been doing beautiful work there and and with others. And it's so what attracts me to it? It's the wholeness of it, the the humanness of it, the way in which it's willing to uh, to do blends to to uh, keep the strengths that are there, but also bring in um, other things. Uh, and so in that situation out of the, the others in the bright future network have created what we call the cloud team which is uh, on people in the cloud so online who are uh, working to serve uh, his organization which is r-e-d-e-s which is the um, the, the network for eco village uh, emergence and development in the Sahal is the English for that, but it's the uh, Redis is the initials uh, for that in French. Um, so it's through the Bright Future Network that he got his website really updated. And uh, we've helped with bringing, uh, smoothing the process for him to get um, donations from around the world and um, supporting uh, his programs of uh, bringing students from mostly North America to come and um, do service learning out in those villages in, in various ways. The network has been able to help him do what he's doing more effectively. Mm -hmm. Another place that's really different, another example that's really different is that within the network, we uh, Mitra uh, Martin, who uh, uh, had experience as a tango teacher, with the importance of kind of a person to person pairing kinds of um, communication, and somehow out of that, she developed this sense of creating a what she calls a buddy program, uh, which is a random pairing among people. Um, it, we call it our, our bright future speed dating, uh, where uh, the, the way that the system works is that people opt in for a seven week cycle, and then they have the opportunity to opt in on a week by week basis as to whether they will be randomly paired with somebody else in that pool. And if they are randomly paired, the agreement is that they'll have a one, they'll have a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with that other person, where they arrange uh, what time they will do that. It really works, and they, uh, she and Andre Andreev, who's a, who's another Bright Future Network member, um, 
have created the software that enables us to work, and they piloted it all within the Bright Future Network. You know, the Bright Future Network was their testing ground, and they now have they they're now offering it out to uh, to other uh, groups as well. So we were able to serve as an incubator for them. And so, what did I like about that? I thought, cool, this is a, a way for communities to have a different kind of communication. Um, that you know, there's some there's a magic in that random uh, connection process that creates linkages that wouldn't necessarily happen otherwise. And it's really important in a in an online community where people don't just you know stumble onto each other at the grocery store or, or you know whatever other venue is your common place to to find people. Cool. So those, those are a couple of examples. I hope that gives you some sense. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of questions coming in that I'll transition to. Mm -hmm. um, and that I would encourage if there are people who want to directly ask their questions to do so as well. Um, so in terms of a network that you are um, stewarding, um, so the question goes, the, the term woke is a derogatory term being used in the culture war. As many of us see hope in the possibilities of growing and being uh, open to seeing ourselves better, what are your thoughts on the use of that term? I have, cho I have chosen to not run from that characterization, but encourage my friends to dig deeper and not participate in the animizing. Yeah, well, it's not, it's not particularly a term that, that I use one way or another, because it does feel like it's, it's, it's become a, you know, yet another culture war football or what, whatever. Um, I think the more general thing that I would say is that labels are labels and words, words serve a purpose in moving from one person to another person. So you really have to think about not only which words work for you, but which words work for whoever your audience is. Um, and so um, I would encourage you to, you know, and it's so imperfect. I mean, I, in, in, in one of the Foundation Stones videos, I've got this illustration of, of two people talking to each other and they're both using the word dog. And there are these little uh, pictures in their heads with, in one head, there's this really lovely, warm, uh, fuzzy dog. And in the other, there's this snarling. Uh, and it's, words are like that. I mean, you, you, you can't guarantee what the connotations will be in the listener. Uh, but I think it's important for us to be thoughtful about who is our audience, not only immediately, but who is the audience in the surround. And if how can we choose words that will work for us and also words that it will be no regrets words, I guess is one way to put it. Um, and that's hard, but it's part of the work that, that, um, that we need to do. And the important thing isn't the word. I mean, if you're, if you're fighting over words, if you're fighting over definitions, it means that you're actually not in the right place. Um, as soon as you start fighting over definitions, it's an indicator you need to shift from an object <laughs> categorical perception to a territory perception, because there's a lot more going on. Um, and there is signal, this is, I'll also bring in signal and noise. So there's signal in the notion of wokeness. Um, uh, there's also noise in it. Simply by putting it something in the past indicates that, that woke is an experience, you've done it, check that box, you're now, you're now uh, part of the already awakened. Um, for me, it's it's an ongoing process. Um, and so anyway, um, I think that's probably enough. Yeah. Um, Shayla, you have a question? Yes, I do. Um, Robert, I just want to thank you very much for what you've offered here. Mm -hmm. um, I, I especially am very grateful for 
the way you work with directly with the nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's a big part of my work too. And I think it makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. So I had two questions. And the first one is, I noticed from the beginning that your, your whole approach, you emphasized long-term incremental shifts rather than um, uh, immediate crisis responses. Mm -hmm. And that feels like a, a critical piece to me. And I just um, read something that Benita Roy wrote about this mm -hmm. um, just very recently in which she said she's critiquing um, a lot of our current approaches and theories to change and saying that um, they actually invest us heavily in the dynamics of crisis, including all the complexity, escalating complexity, accelerating risk, the complex adaptive systems thinking. She said they've, they've put us in this place where our, our, our bodies and minds are constantly so I, and I feel there's some, there's some resonance there mm -hmm. for you. And I'd love to just hear a bit more from you about that. Yeah. Well, I love tipping points. I think they're cool, you know, but I also see tipping points as, you know, and, and, you know, those can be very dramatic and there can be a kind of sense of, well, crisis or, you know, breakthrough or whatever it is when those happen. But if you enlarge your picture, my sense is that every time you actually find a tipping point, there's been a lot of preparation for it. And so it's, I'm not categorically appro opposed to dealing with crises when they happen, uh, but, but I think a crisis, an ongoing crisis mentality does not serve us well. Yeah, that's and, what she's saying. Yeah, uh, so I would totally agree uh, that the, and most of what needs to be done is the more incremental stuff. Um, it's, you know, every tipping point, 90, 90, 90 or 99% of what is actually in the whole system around it was incremental stuff. And so I think it's, it's, it's important for, for those of us who really want to do as much as we can to move the culture forward, to become really comfortable dealing, uh, you know, putting energy into things that seem incremental, that, that uh, you know, geez, how could this make a difference? How did it make a difference to hold up a, a peace quilt to some random bureaucrat in the Soviet Union? But you never know where those things are gonna lead. Um, and, so I think that that's really, so, so I'm totally on board with, with uh, it sounds like what um, Benita Roy yeah, was thanks. saying. Yeah, thanks. I love, I love that. I love that distinction between the tipping point and understanding how it became a tipping point. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that with me. And then I wondered if you could just quickly um, say a little bit more about you said, don't get stuck in age of enlightenment idealism. Can you just yeah. say a bit more right. about what that is, the distinction right. there? Well, so I'm being, you know, all this stuff is gross generalization. So I'm just going to acknowledge that I'm, yeah. I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but the, for me, Part of the age of enlightenment idealism was the I, the concept that um, that if we just got reasonable people together and we just had a rational conversation that we could figure it out and then we could design like a machine what needed to happen. Mm -hmm. um, and it's that presumes that there are people where, this, where the underlying psychodynamics don't matter. I haven't found any of them yet. <laughs> um, and it uh, also the presumption that we can just design things like machines and get them uh, and, and then it'll all be done. Uh, yeah, so as, as, you know. 
Yeah. I can really feel that, um, how that played out at COP26 this year, mm -hmm. like how much of that was still operating yeah. in the field. Yeah. Right. Well, in the whole presumption that, that, you know, we just, if we, if, if the smart people can just get together and make the right policies That's right. and then instruct everybody else to follow those policies, then it's done. Um, well, I don't think that we've done that experiment and yeah, you know, there's some value to some policies, but um, there's a sweet spot there and by themselves, they don't do it. Um, yeah. Wow. That's so helpful. Cause as you speak, I can feel how much of our culture is still totally steeped in all of that. Yeah. And, and um, just to feel the, the groundedness when you say we've done that experiment. <laughs> We have the evidence is in. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Shayla. Um, I'd love to then build a bridge from there around getting stuck in the uh, age of enlightenment idealism here uh, on, on onto a different, um, I guess, vertical here where mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll read the question first and then I'll contextualize it a little bit to my understanding of the question. Um, Minecraft uh, is more popular than the current Olympics, a, a video game at the moment. The collection of possibilities is integral to a non-dominant inclusivity in a constantly changing landscape. Is this worth contemplation uh, uh, for its long uh, educated effect in terms of children's speed? Um, and part of my uh, understanding of that question also involves, you know, the, the way that we relate to education is heavily around the notion that you know will make the policies that the children will then follow suit in and mm -hmm. i think there are there are developing um uh, uh, there's there there are evolving dynamics in terms of how children are learning with regard to say um digital um interactions mm -hmm. that are very much changing that how do you feel about that development yeah well i'll acknowledge that i'm not as savvy around minecraft as i might be uh, my my granddaughter could educate me quite a bit about it. Um, and it's, I think one of the, one of the contextual things that I wanna say is that our, our industrial education system got going at a time when for most people, the only printed material that they had in their house was a Bible, um, you know, back over a century ago. Uh, we are, information environment has changed so dramatically from that point in time. Uh, but our educational paradigm has not really caught up uh, reasonably well. Uh, both of my children were unschooled. Uh, that what most people would recognize as homeschooling, but uh, we, we created environments in which among other things, the school was one of the resources. And so they had some periods of time when they actually went to the public schools, but it was not a, a requirement um, uh, for all that. Um, it, and it's because we're in such a rich environment now, and you, by the way, you can find this in, one of the 1980s education issues that, that my, uh, still my ideal for uh, the, the new paradigm for education is that we used to have a setup where the library was one of the elements within the school. And, uh, but the school was mostly about classes. We need to shift that around and recognize that now the library is huge and let classes be one of the offerings within the library. And that what, what the culture provides to children is learning facilitators, learning resource people who can help them navigate through the library, who can help them discern places where, you know, well, maybe they, it's not their favorite subject, but they would actually do well to to spend a little bit of time on that subject. And by the way, there's this really cool game that if you do that, you'll get it anyway. Um, you know, we could, there's so much more stuff 
that we could be doing, um, plus providing more children with exposure to the life of adults and not just the life of adults in, in homes. Uh, that's the way people, that's the way humans learned for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, and there's a lot to be said to, for it. Uh, so Minecraft may very well be, a, you know, providing some really wonderful education, both in terms of creative expression and in terms of collaboration and a whole variety of different things. Um, better than uh, some of the more violently oriented video games, which all presume the kind of dominator hero uh, uh, model. Uh, so it's really, it's good to know that, that, that there's a, a, a set of choices uh, in terms of what's available in that way. Mm. Cool. Uh, Renee, you had a question. Would you like to ask it? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, what, what I really like about the harmonies is that it sort of separates out uh, the big blob into, into different specific areas that you can tune into. However, being a complex adaptive system, mm -hmm. it's, it's all one again. Right. Um, and then thinking about the um, equation of chains and the S-curve, mm -hmm. What what are sort of the dynamics uh, across and between uh, the harmonies? And and I'm thinking about uh, nature as a reference. When you have an imbalance in the soil, then you get plants that we generally call weeds mm -hmm. that actually restore the balance. And if you have a hard right. soil, you get deep roots that break up the soil. Uh, if there's a pH imbalance, you get certain weeds that that restore it. Mm -hmm. So how how do I need to look at the harmonies? And, and as can, can, for instance, uh, the, the ecosystem inform us in, in another square with the harmonies? Yes. Yeah. Um, oh my, Na I mean, nature is such an inspiration. And I think that the, you know, the more we can really tune into that, and draw from it both through conceptual understandings and through being with, just the process of being with uh, feels very nourishing to me. Uh, I get a little chill in my body as I just tune into that memory. Um, so it's, I think there's this ongoing dance between sometimes it is helpful to segment and differentiate and focus in for a while um, so that it doesn't just become this, this overwhelming blur. Um, but you need to then step back into the hole. And, and this is a bit of a left brain, right brain dance. Uh, because the left brain is is better with the focusing and the right brain is better with the um, and I really really feel as though it's the the important piece here is to get into that more dynamic process that allows you to do one for a while and then develop the sensitivity and the self-awareness that, okay, this has kind of run its course for now. I, I need to step back out, or I've been out, I need to step in, uh, or I've been in this area. It's no longer the constraint that it was, but something else in another area has now become the constraint. You know, if, if you're focused on releasing constraints, there's always a next constraint. Uh, and the part of the, you know, we, as you've been struggling, as I've been struggling to release a particular constraint, you know, and I get good at it and I get, you know, real satisfaction from that. And it's, it's almost like, oh my God, do you mean I got to go to a totally new constraint uh, where I'm learning, where I'm at the bottom of the learning curve again? Uh, but the, the more we can do that and support each other 
in that and do it with compassion and with humor. Um, it just feels to me the faster we go. Any follow up on that, Renee? Yes, well, I had a, a second question following on as well. We've been talking about the internet and the, your vast experience of it. Um, and also thinking about where we are today with the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when you consider it with our socializing and normalizing as a human beings, we, we have centuries of experience with that in the offline world. Right. Where are we uh, in the internet in, in relation to that? Yeah, we're just beginning from my perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're stubbing our toes and we're finding out that, that um, you know, trying to bring the Facebook model as, as our basis for, anyway, <laughs> their problems. Uh, but I don't think that kills it. Mm -hmm. I don't think in any way that, that um, I think we're, it, you know, the, the creativity that's out there, the stuff that's moving along, um, and it's so vital, really, that we develop this um, planetary nervous system and 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 it's going to be up to all of us as to just how it develops i mean this is part of why this is such a juicy time to be alive i mean if you were choosing incarnations you didn't make a mistake to choose this one um, let me put it that way um, the what we can contribute you know, it may feel painful to us as we work through this stuff and all of all of that. But you know, I did this talk where I titled it, We Haven't Been Able to Have This Much Fun for 5,000 Years. And, and I'm, you know, I mean it. And I think the more that we can really tune into this time as a time when we are here, where really important choices are being made. And I think that there is a long-term cultural momentum um, that it isn't like we get to choose whether or not that momentum is there, it's there. But we do get it to choose a lot about how smoothly it proceeds. So I, I like the analogy of seeing ourselves as midwives and the midwife isn't causing the birth, but a midwife can make a big difference in terms of how the birth goes. And there's a very wide spectrum there. I mean, it can be stillborn baby with dead mother at one end, or it can be a, a beautiful birth, an ecstatic experience at the other. And clearly you look at the world as a whole and we're not gonna be, you know, we're certainly not gonna be at the totally ecstatic pole. There's enough suffering that's going on in the world. But, but the stuff that we do can help to relieve some of that suffering, relieve some of these birth pains, um, and speed up the process. And that's what I, what I feel, what I personally feel really called to, is doing whatever I can to speed up that process. Thank you. That's really encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd love to bring that back into, as we head towards the, to the end of this session, I'd love to bring that back and re-emphasize the point that um, that we began this session with, which is around the nature of the times that we're in, as you understand it. Mm -hmm. And would you uh, kind of reemphasize for us the, the yeah, like, like Rene just said, the kind of encouraging nature, the possibility of agency in a time of deep uncertainty and complexity, and how understanding and practicing in terms of our um, motivation structures and cycle dynamics is a core part of um, supporting that. All right, David, you're, you're, you're brilliant in being able to put all those pieces together. I don't know whether I'll be able to. Um, but just to say that uh, clearly there are many things falling apart in the world at this point. The bad news about that is that things are falling apart, things that in various ways that we depend on, things that... Um, that as they fall apart, cause suffering, you know, so there's, there's all of that obvious downside. The upside is that we don't have the terrible part. They're falling apart on their own. 
the big missing piece is what, what's, what's the next step? What can we put in place? What is it that people can step to? Because people won't step forward, even if where they are right now is awful. You can't expect people to move to something else if there isn't something else to move to. And so for me, the big opportunity in these times for those of us who are tuned in in this way is to really build the new culture. You know, build a culture that's savvy about psychodynamics, et cetera, uh, and do that. And we have to do that in our own lives. But, but I do feel that the next real wave around this is gonna be doing it in organizations. And as, as more and more organizations are able to do this, and especially as more and more businesses are able to do this, I think we're, we are reaching one of those tipping points because there's such a hunger for being able to be, to have your work life be, I'll just put it this way, much more planetary. Mm -hmm. um, that when there are more and more opportunities for people to do that, um, geez, the, the, you know, the accumulated pressure for that is huge right now. And, and as that starts to happen, that's going to affect politics. It'll affect the, you know, all kinds of aspects of the economy. It'll, you know, have huge effects all over the place. Um, so that's where it's in our personal lives, in our interpersonal lives, in our work lives, that feels to me like the really juicy growing edge right now. Mm. Cool. And with that, I think I, I feel really um, resonating with the frame of contextualizing the, this, these four sessions as a, a, a set of cultural artifacts that kind of put forward a, a framing by which um, any viewer, those who have participated, participated with us throughout the way and afterwards who listens to this, even if they may have, you know, they may listen to this, who knows, uh, centuries later, act as a kind of um, uh, artifact for the emergent processes that we very much participate in with every choice that we make on an individual level and with each other. And so thank you very much, Robert, for uh, a really incredible four sessions. And thanks to everyone who has joined. Um, I think at this point, we'll transition out. If you are interested in uh, Robert's work, you can go to context.org. Um, and if you are interested in more events on the STOA, you can go to the STOA.ca. Um, and with that, uh, any last words from you, Robert? Just gratitude. Gratitude to all of you here for, for your attention is precious. And you've chosen to direct your attention in this way. So I, I appreciate that. And I really encourage you to do what you can for this incredible, whatever, this incredible place that we call Earth. You know, get the most out of this incarnation and give the most from it. And with that, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Robert. <laughs>